thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Life Seminar Series dedicated to the research and academic communities. The seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on the Kiskin YouTube channel. So you can always go back and rewatch the episode, but you can ask questions afterwards. Uh, I'm your host, Slatko Minna from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the pleasure and privilege of hosting uh, someone that has been very special in my own career uh, and, and is one of the uh, uh, my favorite professors of physics and one of the perhaps best explainers of ideas that I've met. So uh, hello, Jack. It's a real pleasure to see you again and welcome to the Kiskid Live seminar series. Hi, Zlatko. How are you? I'm well. And uh, where are you tuning in from today, Jack? Scenic New Haven, Connecticut. All right. Uh, that used to be home for me uh, quite a, for quite a number of years. And uh, of course, I had the pleasure and privilege of starting out in your lab video. And I learned a lot in the process. So my appreciation to you for that uh, again. Sure. <laughs> and before we get to your talk, Jack, uh, allow me to begin with an introduction. Uh, Professor Harris is a professor of physics and applied physics at Yale University and a member of the Yale Quantum Institute. Jack received his undergraduate degree from Cornell, his PhD from Santa Barbara, where he developed ultra-sensitive micromechanical sensors uh, in the group of David Ashalam. He's He was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard MIT uh, Center for Ultra-Cold Atoms. And since joining the Yale faculty in 2004, uh, his group has revolutionized the field of optomechanics in a way pioneering the work uh, such as membrane and the middle devices. Uh, Jack is also the recipient of many awards and uh, honors such as the Vannevar Bush, the APS Fellow, Arthur Green, and many others. Um, and I think with that, Jack, we are ready to pull up your slides. I'll ask questions okay. during the talk and people can put those in the comment chat box. So uh, take it away. Okay. Yeah, I should say, uh, first of all, thank you uh, to Zlatko and everyone there for setting this up and for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to interact with the folks at IBM. Um, let me see. So first of all, oh boy, can you see my um, title yes. slide here? I can and see your title the, slide and the laser. Okay, great. And I should say, you know, please feel free to pepper Zlatko with questions. I'm really happy to take questions in the middle of the talk and everything. Um, so, uh, my name is Jack Harris, I'm uh, faculty at Yale University, and uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about quantum optomechanics experiments, and I'm going to be really thinking about these experiments um, as being motivated by an interest in macroscopic quantum phenomena, specifically. Um, so I'll describe the connection between optomechanics and macroscopic quantum phenomena. I'll spend a little bit of time on pedagogy to try and I don't know if quantify is the right word, but maybe clarify a bit both what we mean by quantum effects and what we mean by macroscopic or massive objects. Uh, both, both of those terms, even though they sound familiar, take a little bit of care. Um, I'll describe why superfluid helium is a really outstanding material in which to study these effects. And I'll describe how single photon detectors, even though what we're interested in is motion, vibrations, and eventually phonons, I'll explain how it is that single photon detectors are a really super useful resource for us in these experiments. Um, I'll describe how we use them uh, to measure the motion of a relatively macroscopic object as it vibrates, and particularly how we use our single photon detectors to measure the phonon-phonon correlations in the mechanical devices. And at the end, I'll talk about some interesting next steps. But first, let me start by thanking uh, our collaborator, Jacob Reichel in Paris, who makes these devices possible. My whole group here, but the folks who've really worked on the projects I'm telling you about are highlighted in blue. And I really want to especially call out uh, the work done by the postdoc leading this project, Yogesh Patil, whose work has just been outstanding. Thanks also to our theory collaborators and, of course, our funding sources. Okay, so as I said, like the motivation, like the reason that I think of that we are doing this is because we're curious about the question of in how large an object can you see quantum mechanical effects? And I think there are three possible reasons uh, why you might be interested in pursuing this. Maybe all three of them, maybe just one of them. The first is really just, you know, gee whiz, it would be amazing. Uh, I mean, I think that the fact that Marcus Arndt's group in Vienna can take molecules that look like this 
put them in the gas phase and launch them down meters of vacuum tube and have them pass through real physical slits, real holes in a wall, and then collect those molecules one by one on a phosphor screen, which is what you're seeing here, and seeing their individual arrival, but seeing that their individual arrival pattern is modulated by the interference of the wave function associated with the center of mass of this pretty big object. And if all that this field accomplished was to like keep doing this with bigger and bigger objects as the years went by, I would regard that as time well spent in a lofty scientific goal. At the same time, mechanical systems in the classical domain are very sophisticated, robust technology, whether it's in your cell phones or in gravitational wave detectors. And by and large, if you can take a technology like that and append to it some quantum functionality, usually there's some kind of gains to be had. Um, lastly, I would say it is possible that we will run into true surprises. Um, you could say that while quantum mechanics is this wonderfully, uh, extensively, precisely tested theory, there are regimes in which we know relatively little about it and, which, and in which it is reasonable to imagine there might be surprises. Maybe one example that I would give is the idea that if you're talking about quantum effects in the motion of macroscopic objects, well, suppose those objects are so massive that they distort the space-time geometry in their neighborhood in some appreciable way. That would mean that a superposition of this object it being in two places at once, which quantum mechanically is you know, pretty trivial, would have to uh, include in that description a superposition of the space-time metric surrounding uh, that area. And that's not something we have a theory for. There is no you know, theory of quantum uh, space-time geometry. And it is an area of active speculation by theorists as to whether or not experiments that we could imagine in the next you know, decades, let's say, in which the masses are relatively small, their deformations of space-time are certainly very modest, all the motion is very non-relativistic, um, but they wonder whether such experiments might actually be able to tell us something about the structure of an eventual full theory of quantum gravity. And this is, I'm referring to the work of people like Roger Penrose and Diyoshi and various others here. Uh, so I'm not really qualified to comment on the merit of that work, but it's something we keep an eye on as a motivation for this overall work in thinking about quantum effects and macroscopic objects. So the particular kind of uh, apparatuses that we're going to consider here are what are called optomechanical systems, and specifically cavity optomechanical systems. And here the idea, uh, which was really originated by Einstein back in 1909, is that one useful way of thinking about this is to admit that light is a microscopic degree of freedom over which you know, we have a, a fair bit of control uh, and understanding of how to describe its quantum state. And in practice today, we could make a well-defined quantum state of light. And then the point is we send it into a region where it is going to undergo a unitary interaction with the motion of some macroscopic object. This is the object whose potentially quantum effects we like to study. And the key point is if the light interacts unitarily with this object's motion, they will become entangled with each other. Uh, almost always we have to use a cavity uh, to enhance the strength of this interaction, but that's a technicality. Um, and in optomechanics, usually we're interested in the fact that a, a pretty good way of getting a unitary interaction between the position of a microgram or kilogram scale object and photon is through radiation pressure. That's just an interaction that, although it's very weak, immediately satisfies this condition and will result in entanglement between the electromagnetic degree of freedom and the emotional degree of freedom. Um, and then what are we going to do? Uh, then we're going to let the light leak back out of the cavity and fall on some kind of detector drawn from the well established technology for characterizing the quantum state of light. Um, we are not going to look directly ever at the mechanical object. We just don't have that technology very well. We're going to rely on our technology for measuring light uh, to see what happens and say, look, given that we prepared such and such a state and sent it into here and got back such and such a state or such and such a set of features in our data, what can we infer about the quantum behavior, if any, of this macroscopic object over here? Okay, so that's optomechanics in a nutshell. And um, the way that we describe it, uh, if you want it at this quantitative level is via Hamiltonian, which starts off by saying, we have a mechanical oscillator. Here it is with its operators. We have an electromagnetic 
oscillator. Here it is with its photon creation and annihilation operators. Um, but the resonant frequency of the optical cavity depends on the position of this object here. As it moves back and forth, it's going to stretch and compress the eigenmodes of this cavity. And so if we take the dependence of the cavity frequency on the oscillator's position and rewrite that position in terms of phonon operators, this is what we get. Two simple harmonic oscillators with the interesting coupling nonlinearity term here, characterized by an overall rate, G naught, which is basically you can think of as how much is this cavity detuned by this mechanical object's zero point motion. There are a lot of analogies here to atom cavity QED or qubit strip line QED, um, but not all of the analogies are perfect. But this one's, this one's pretty close to what we know as G. Um, and in these uh, devices, we care about, you know, sort of dimensionless combinations of their parameters. We'd like the cavities line with kappa to be small enough that we have a high finesse for this cavity. We'd like the mechanical oscillator's damping rate to be small enough that it has high Q. Sometimes we want it to oscillate fast compared to the amount of time a photon spends in the cavity. That's called the resolved sideband regime. Um, this mechanical oscillator is going to be coupled to a bath somehow with temperature T. And so we're interested in, you know, on average, how many phonons are there living in this mechanical oscillator? In terms of the optomechanical coupling, what we can hope to accomplish with this system depends an awful lot on how this coupling rate compares with the loss rates. One way to think about G0 is that it's the rate at which a phonon that is stuck in this cavity exchanges energy with the mechanical oscillators, the rate at which this photon inelastically scatters, leaving behind or extracting one phonon from this mechanical oscillator. And if that's happening uh, very slowly with the rate that photons are being gobbled up and phonons are being gobbled up by the environment, then you know the phenomena you have access to are limited. And if the rate is happening more quickly, well, that's better. And the kind of holy grail in this field would be to be in a situation in which that phonon-photon swapping rate is kind of the biggest frequency scale in the problem, uh, or at least it satisfies this condition, which physically has a very simple interpretation. You have this cavity, it's a bit flexible. You send in one photon to the cavity, just one photon in there, and the radiation pressure is big enough that it pushes the mirror by an amount large enough that the cavity is now detuned by more than a line width, which means that by putting one photon into this cavity, uh, the entrance of a second photon is blocked. Single photon blockade. That's a really, uh, that's an effect that would really give us access to nonlinear dynamics at the single quantum level. And nobody has done this to date. This is just not technically possible so far in optomechanical systems. Nevertheless, it's something we would really like, or we would really like an adequate substitute. We really like something that would give us nonlinear dynamics at the single quantum level for reasons that I'll explain in the next slide. And this is where things are a little bit pedagogical. Um, so as Latko, everybody is happy and quite quiescent. Yeah, I think so far this is this is great, great and very clear. Thank you. Jack. Uh, also, nice to know that you can actually hear me, and I'm not just talking to a room of. <laughs> it's always a little bit hard with the yeah. lack of a room uh, feedback. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, the point I want to make here is uh, twofold. I want to explain why we need some nonlinearity, and I also want to explain sort of the fact that when we talk about looking for quantum effects in macroscopic objects. It's actually important to realize that quantum effects is not just like a yes or no answer. Um, I think it's safe to say that the various phenomena you might observe, um, you know, require either more or less of the counterintuitive apparatus of quantum mechanics for their explanation. Likewise, they invalidate more or less of our comfortable classical notion of the universe. And so I want to start by just kind of sketching a very subjective notion of this hierarchy of more and less quantum effects. And let me do that, first of all, in terms of the state that we can prepare for a harmonic oscillator. Now, what you have is a harmonic oscillator, and you can prepare it in its ground state. And what I say will hold also for any coherent state or thermal state, but let's just focus on a ground state. And then suppose you measure the object's position with a perfect position meter. 
you will get an answer for your measurement, and we believe that it will be drawn from a certain ensemble. And your measurement had tons of back action, so you have to re-prepare the system in the ground state, measure its position again. You get a different answer. Re-prepare the system in the ground state, measure the position again. You'll keep getting different answers. But as you build up a histogram, that histogram will look like the Gaussian, the square modulus of the ground state wave function, as illustrated here. Now, if sometimes you measure instead, uh, after cooling it to the ground state, you measure its momentum, uh, again, those results will give you uh, a histogram, a variety of different results that looks like what's shown here. It's also a Gaussian. And uh, neither of these histograms is particularly remarkable on their own, but it's interesting to note that they can be regarded as the marginals of an underlying distribution that I've sketched out here in two dimensions, this quantity P, which I would like to interpret as the purely classical statistical probability for the a priori joint value of the object's position and momentum. I'd like to say that before you do your measurement, there is a perfectly well-defined probability that you will have such and such an x and such and such a p. It's given by this. If I tell that story, uh, then that story will reproduce the outcomes of your measurements as the marginals of this underlying distribution. And the point of that is that even though I would say, hey, this width was set by zero point motion and that has H bar in it and that's quantum mechanics, um, there's nothing qualitative in the data that really requires quantum mechanics. A skeptic could say, nope, all you have is a harmonic oscillator that is coupled to a thermal bath whose temperature is such that in the usual classical stat mech sense, it's described by this probability function in its phase space. And there's nothing that I, as an experimentalist with access to this kind of state, could do to refute such an explanation. Okay, uh, however, if I'm able to prepare a slightly different state, I mean, in undergraduate textbooks, this is like barely different state, the first excited state, and I repeat the same story of preparing that state, measuring its position over and over again, uh, plotting the histogram of outcomes, doing the same thing with momenta, and then saying, okay, what is the function living in the space spanned by these two variables uh, whose marginals give me these distributions, I can indeed construct such a function. Here it is plotted, but it has to take on negative values. Okay, And so what that means is that this function is not a probability. It's not the a priori joint probability of a certain well-defined x simultaneous with a certain well-defined p whose marginals you're measuring. It's something else. You know, if you're talking about a probability, it doesn't have negative values. And so access to this kind of state suddenly means that you're able to rule out any pre-existing uh, probability distribution for X and P. If you like here, you're getting direct access at the deeper structure of quantum mechanics, something associated with the fact that X and P really don't commute with each other. Okay. But it hinges on having access to this state. We could push even further up the hierarchy and say, well, suppose I have two harmonic oscillators that are well separated from each other, and I can prepare a state something like this, where there's an excitation in one of the oscillators, but I don't know which one. Then I can tell a similar story. It's not precisely identical, but a really uh, closely parallel story to the one I told you over here, where I define some variables uh, associated with one of the oscillators. I just define a variable associated with one with the other oscillator. I prepare the state, I measure, I prepare the state, I measure, I get a certain outcomes, I generate their histogram, and I ask if those histograms are consistent with any underlying probability distribution that would assign a priori values to the properties of these oscillators. And the answer would be no. This is uh, the essence of Bell's theorem. And here, again, I've shown uh, that my measurements are inconsistent with pre-existing values, but here they're in inconsistent with them in a way that underscores the non-local structure of the multi-body wave function. Okay. And so I would say this is sort of even more interesting, more quantum, more non-classical than just measuring what I would call uh, negative Wigner functions over here. Okay, so this is, you know, qualitative, subjective hierarchy. It's not meant to be exhausted by any means. There's lots of other phenomena you could ask about, like where do squeeze states fit in here? What about like at Gargan equalities, all different things. It's an interesting question to ask out of these pieces together. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. This is this is really nice and very clear. And and I guess it's a good way to to explain also why you, you can't really have this 
joint probability distributions uh, explaining the outcomes of quantum observables in general. I guess it only works for certain special states, like you mentioned. Yeah, they're not super special. It's actually like kind of a biggish class, but it's they're not exhaustive for sure. Like I'm not in a careful set measure way. I'm not sure if it's a large or small fraction of all quantum states, but like for harmonic oscillators, Okay, so now the point that I'm one point that I'm gonna make is like for harmonic oscillators, these are overwhelmingly what you get with any linear interactions, any linear drive you want to apply, any kind of reasonable path you couple your system to, you will be stuck here. So uh, if you have harmonic oscillators, this state is frustratingly difficult to make. You apply any linear drive to the ground state and you get a coherent state, which has this property. So just to get this state, which in textbooks looks trivial, um, take some nonlinear dynamics in your system. And that's why the field is so keen on getting these uh, really large strong couplings that would result in intrinsic nonlinear dynamics or finding some other route. And in this talk, I'll, I'll be telling you about a different route to nonlinearities that would actually allow you to generate states like this. And even actually at the end of my talk, I'll describe states like this. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens in the case of two oscillators with, um, oh, I guess, yes, you yes you need, you need the single photon states. Otherwise, if you have two coherent states in the green box on the right, you, you would have one of these Gaussian looking probabilities and nothing. Yeah, so two mode squeezing uh, would not have this particular property. It may have other interesting properties that you would want to define in this hierarchy. Um, you know, P function, uh, for example, but just with this one quick pass at illustrating the fact that there is a hierarchy, yeah, two-mode squeezing state would not look particularly interesting in this regard. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the other point is that uh, it's not just about what state you can produce, it's about how you can measure those states. And this is really key to uh, the experiments that we'll be doing. What I just described, imagine that you have a harmonic oscillator and you have this super idealized von Neumann style position measurement. And these just don't exist. Like it's great for talking about quantum mechanics, but we just don't have such a thing. Usually what we have is a mechanical oscillator off of which we can bounce light. And when we bounce light off of it, we might measure that light on a photodiode, you know, a square law, sort of slow square law uh, photo detector. And if that's the detector that you have, then it's pretty straightforward to show between like the shot noise of the photons, if you like, falling on your detector or the back action, however you want to think about it, this kind of measurement, even if you have these exotic states, is going to give you data very much in this category, the category of more or less Gaussian quantum effects. Um, on the other hand, if you have your oscillator, and maybe you can make some interesting states with it, and you bounce light off of it, but you collect that light with a photomultiplier tube, a single photon detector that really goes click, um, then suddenly the story is a little different, and you are one is able to access kind of richer class of quantum states. And this will be really what I'll be focusing on in my talk. Um, a little bit more uh, extreme version would be uh, coupling the mechanical oscillator directly to a two level system, which maybe you then read out in some QND dispersive way. This is really uh, you know, the gold standard, uh, but for now we're gonna work with this kind of approach here. Um... Yeah, and sorry, Jack. Maybe I missed this, and you said it. Could you, um, when you have when you say so, the first one measurement on the very left, we, we would call mm -hmm. uh, homodyne. Um, the second one with the diode is. Yeah, I would not call this homodyne. This is a strong projective position measurement. Like, oh, sorry, you're right. Yeah. That you would read about in a textbook. That's right. Uh, that would be the continuous version. Uh, mm-hmm. And the characteristic of the diode measurement again is it, this is something in between a photo detector and yeah, it's a weak measurement. A weak measurement, gotcha. Yeah. So this is a weak measurement. This is a strong measurement of the position. This is a weak measurement of the optical field, which in turn is being used to infer the measure, position. This is a strong measurement of the optical field, uh, but indirectly being applied to the mechanics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, gotcha. So that's kind of the picture that we started with. And I guess the other thing I'd say, like, this is all about like how quantum is a certain experiment going to be. The other thing that would be nice to describe is how macroscopic is it? Again, uh, it's pretty like the answer to that question is qualitative, or maybe I would say context dependent. There's no unique definition of it, but there is a way to talk sensibly about it depending on what you're interested in. I don't have time to kind of 
and I go through that. But there's kind of a qualitatively similar story for talking about how macroscopic a certain situation might be. Okay, so given that we want to use single photon detectors to coax out some slightly rich quantum behavior of mechanical oscillators, let me give you a quick description of how that story plays out in optomechanics. Uh, so I'd tell the story this way. Imagine I have a cavity and I'm sending in green laser light. Um, what I will get back out is green laser light. There's nothing more to say about it than that. On the other hand, if this cavity features a mirror that is not infinitely stiff but oscillates at some frequency omega m, then each green photon that can come in might scatter elastically and come out green, but it might also absorb a photon from this mechanical oscillator's motion and come out blue shifted. This would result in a blue motional sideband of the light, or that green photon could come in and deposit uh, uh, one phonon worth of energy in this oscillator and come out red shifted as a red motional sideband over here. Um, and that's the basic picture we want because if you now imagine putting a detector here that really goes click, then you tell the story, look, I send in one green photon, I get out a photon, it goes click. And if that photon was blue, then I know something. I know that exactly one phonon has been removed from this mechanical oscillator. And if that photon click came from a red photon, I would say, hey, I know something about the quantum state of this mechanical oscillator. Whatever it was before my measurement, it's now that with one phonon added to it. Okay. So that's the essential idea that we'd like to employ. Um, this idea has been you know, well developed in the quantum optics community for a long time. It was introduced to optomechanics here. Um, and the technical challenge is that most photo detectors that go click don't really tell you that it was a click from a blue photon or a green one or a red one. And given the weak coupling that takes place inside these cavities, only about one photon in 100 million gets taken out of the green beam and put in a blue beam. So unless you have some other source of information, when you get a click here, it's overwhelmingly likely to have been from a green photon that tells you nothing about the motion of the oscillator. So the idea that was uh, suggested was really inelegant. <laughs> the idea was just put a nice filter cavity here such that the only light that passes through is your red shifted light, let's say. And now when you get a click, you say, hey, I got a click. I know it was from a red shifted photon. That tells me that one phonon was just added to this mechanical oscillator. Okay. And then uh, at that point, I may have prepared an interesting quantum state. Like if that oscillator was initially in its ground state and I get a click over here, I've added one phonon to it. I have now prepared that difficult, challenging, and interesting first excited state of this mechanical oscillator. And Jack, uh, the cavity resonance line width that you're plotting in the gray background here, that's determined mm -hmm. by the coupling, not the intrinsic loss of the cavity. That is determined by the intrinsic loss of the cavity. So this gray yeah. line is just the cavity's line width. And the oh. gray filter line is just the filter's passband. Gotcha. So it's an um, undercoupled cavity, or sorry, overcoupled? No, which uh, basically, yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter for this. Well, it doesn't matter. So you're just going to send in light at the cavity resonance. Hopefully that light actually gets into the cavity. And then, you know, while this guy is jiggling back and forth, Classically, you can think of that as putting phase modulation sidebands on the light. And you'd like those phase modulation sidebands to be able to get into the cavity, which I tried to illustrate by there having some overlap with the cavity density of states. But that's that's basically it. OK, right. Yeah, maybe it, then it's actually the total um, line width that matters, I suppose, for this. Yeah, um, well, both. Uh, Mm -hmm. But the just like if you told me you had an opt over coupled cavity or an under coupled cavity, this would give you differences in the details, but not at the level we're worried about here. Gotcha. This whole story would work either way. You would just have sort of a different set of losses to think about. Okay, so that's the idea. It's been implemented experimentally, I should say, in a few groups also. So when I called it inelegant, that was really a compliment. Yeah, uh, you know, it's inelegant and it works, and we are copying it because it's a really good idea. Um, so the devices that we've been using look like this. In some sense, they're just generic fabry pro cavities with something in them that can move. At this point, we could skip everything and just go on to the data, but it's nice to say a little bit about how these are actually built. They're built using this wonderful technique developed by Jacob Reichel, where he can take a single mode fiber, uh, zap it with a CO2 laser to generate an ultra smooth concavity. 
It can be sent off to fancy optics companies who will coat it with very high finesse mirrors. Um, and then what we found is that you can take two of these fibers, here's one, you can slide it into a glass ferrule, you can take another fiber, slide it into a glass ferrule, align them with some clever tricks, such that between them, you have an optical cavity. So if I was to zoom in cartoon style, you'd have the two ends of these fibers and their curved, smooth, coated faces would confine a mode of the electromagnetic field, which is in fact pretty well coupled to the traveling wave inside the fiber. And if we're doing nothing else, this is just like a wonderfully robust, easy to build, high finesse optical cavity. You, know, you just take the ends of these two fibers and run them out your fridge, just like a coax or any wire and plug it into your bench. And uh, it's very nice. There's no mirror mounts. There's no translation stages. There's no alignment really. Once you do the initial alignments and epoxy it, it's all done. On the other hand, it's also rather boring. There's no mechanics here. It's just a passive linear optical cavity. So to get some emotional degrees of freedom, we just immerse this system in a bucket of liquid helium. And the liquid helium is going to provide us, uh, basically the density waves, the sound waves in the helium, are going to be our mechanical degrees of freedom. So before I describe those uh, sound waves in detail, let me just say from a material science point of view, why superfluid helium is just amazing for quantum optics. Um, first of all, if you want your light matter interaction to be unitary, you want your substance not to be absorbing photons and heating up. Um, and superfluid helium, first of all, it offers the largest band gap of any material, but there are a lot of large band gap materials out there. What it really offers is absolute purity at the atomic level. I mean, uh, macroscopic cubic centimeter samples of liquid helium, if they're carefully handled, will typically have zero non-helium atoms in them. So unlike diamond or aluminum nitride, there will just be no mid-gap states for, there'll be no impurities that would allow absorption of this light in any fashion. Um, uh, there are also no structural defects because it's a liquid. Anyway, all of this goes together. In addition, if we want sort of high quality factor, low damping mechanics, the fact that this is a substance with zero viscosity can't hurt. Um, if we want the device to actually get cold, it's nice that liquid helium has among the highest thermal conductivities at dilution refrigerator temperatures. And this structure here has a really nice property, which is that um, once these mirrors have defined the standing waves for light, the cavity optical modes, um, the wave equations of sound are essentially the same. And so what you'll have in here is acoustic modes with exactly the same profile and essentially perfect overlap. Um, so I haven't drawn them yet here, but if I imagine what a standing wave of sound looks like, it looks exactly like this. So at that point, you have your optical cavity, you have your mechanical oscillator, they're perfectly aligned with maximum overlap, and there's no, no real alignment. You know, we love AttoCube. That company has solved a lot of our problems over the years, but we're also happy to have an experiment in which we don't actually need any translation stages. Okay, so having built this kind of thing, how do the light and sound waves couple to each other? The story is really simple high school physics, basically. If I imagine a certain standing wave of intensity in the cavity, here's one. Um, and then I ask, well, let's, what do the standing waves of sound look like? I have plotted here in blue the density of a certain acoustic standing wave. And it's oscillating back and forth because that's what sound does. Now, the way that these interact with each other is that more dense helium looks like a higher index of refraction. And every half period of the mechanical, the acoustic motion, like right, now, where the photons are here at this antinode, they are seeing too many helium atoms, so to speak, like right now. And then a half period later, they're seeing too few. So the cavity is not physically oscillating, but if you like, the optical length of a given optical mode is oscillating. So for that reason, this is just a, even though it doesn't have a movable end mirror, this is mathematically at the Hamiltonian level, absolutely equivalent to the canonical optomechanical system of the moving end mirror. It has one huge technical advantage though, uh, which is sort of evident in this picture here, which is that if I send in laser light to a certain mode, it couples to one and only one acoustic mode. And that's totally different. If you build uh, an optical cavity with one mirror on a cantilever or a silicon nitride membrane or anything, or a photonic, phononic crystal, your cavity is detuned by the 
mechanical mode of interest that you might want to study, but it's also detuned by all of its other flexural modes and vibrational modes. And this is a giant headache in the field. People still make experiments work, but it is a big pain in the neck. And it's really nice that in these devices, basically because the optical mode and the acoustic mode satisfy the exact same boundary conditions, the basic structure of mode orthogonality means that their overlap integrals are always zero, except in one case. So if I consider this optical mode, same in every case, and then I consider all the different acoustic standing waves, you can see that the overlap integral of optical intensity with helium density is zero, 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 not zero, in fact, maximal, zero, 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 because of just the fact that eigenmodes of a given cavity are all orthogonal functions. Oh, quick question from the audience yeah. also, Daniel. I, I think he had a question, you know, I think you mentioned something along the lines of easy to build, but, uh, you know, how you know, how easy is it to actually build? Um, what would be the main uh, Okay, let me be more, more precise. We <laughs> leverage, it is hard for Jacob Reichel to build and maintain the sophisticated manufacturing process that does this. It's hard for the coding companies to build and maintain the high quality coding things that they do. But if we have those at our disposal, the student goes to Paris and spends two week, weeks in Jacob's lab doing this, which you know, could be worse. Uh, goods mailed off to the coding companies, it comes to us. We have these tricks for aligning them inside glass ferrules that are very robust. Um, you slip them in, you rotate the two fibers to maximize things, you epoxy them in place, you're done. This uh, maintains its alignment with the full finesse of the cavity upon thermal cooling from room temperature to dilfridge temperatures, multiple thermal cycles, a very high yield rate. Um, and that's it. You cool it down, you fill it with helium, you're done. There's no addo cubes, there's no mode matching. Light goes down the fiber into the fridge, couples to this. And yeah, these are really robust uh, devices. So easy is like a word that uh, the faculty member uses, hopefully realizing that it would irritate any of the students who actually have to work very hard to make this happen. But we're awfully glad that we aren't like steering around cryogenic translation stages to align mirrors or anything like that, that all that is taken away. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we're really glad that once we line up the system, we only see, I mean, we, this is just experimentally true. You send in laser light and no matter how hard we drive the mechanics, we only see this mode. We don't see this mode or this mode or this mode or this mode contaminating our data. I see. So the mirrors are symmetrically symmetric enough. Well, if the if the fibers aren't aligned perfectly, wouldn't you then potentially get some uh, coupling between those modes, or is or is it really a property that's invariant of the no. exact? You draw any mirrors you want. You find the normal modes of the electromagnetic field in there. Maybe you did a bad job with your mirrors, and it's a little bit leaky and looks a little funny. Now go and find the normal modes of your acoustic field. They will be identical mm -hmm. because even though they oscillate at different frequencies after you've done separation of variables and pulled out the time dependence, the spatial modes for the sound waves and for the light are determined by exactly the same equations, mm -hmm. at least in the practical approximation. So you always get this overlap, even if you do kind of a so-so job of building the cavity. Mm -hmm. You always get this overlap and you always get this orthogonality. I see. Yeah, it's probably because this isn't near field in some sense. Right. If there's a really tight focus and the fact that, you know, the electromagnetic field is actually a vector field and funny things happen with gooey phase shifts at very tight focuses, then the bets would be off. But in sort of the usual nice praxial approximations, the acoustic modes and the optical modes are identical. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that's the device, and here's again what it looks like, the two ferrules, two fibers coming in. It's simple enough to make that we just, there's no reason to make just one. We have three of them here, fiber uh, in a ferrule, fiber in a ferrule, a little cavity, another pocket with a little cavity, another pocket with a little cavity. This goes in a superfluid leak type can, whose only connections are a capillary fill line to fill it with liquid helium, and then one fiber for each cavity. And so it lives here, this is its connection, everything else is fridge. There's no filters, no translation stages, no, you know, it's extremely simple. If we wanted to, we could definitely put a hundred or a thousand of these devices in a conventional dilution refrigerator. And as I'll mention at the very end of my talk, we think we have a way for making this many devices indistinguishable at the quantum level and really using them as an interesting kind of network for distributing entanglement and the like. 
But for now, I'm just going to focus on one device. OK, so the way the measurement works is very similar to the cartoon I showed before. In practice, what we do is we have two lasers, one that can drive uh, the cavity, let's say, on the blue side. That's the blue laser. Um, that light goes to the cavity. A little bit of it leaks into the cavity. And if it, uh, it may um, emit a phonon and so come out uh, red shifted in light. It's still, it's the blue, we call it the blue sideband because this is blue detuned light. Uh, but when this light goes in, it has, if it absorbs a phonon, that sideband is highly suppressed. If it emits a phonon, that sideband is both allowed into the superfluid cavity. And then that sideband photon is resonantly passed through our filter cavities and then sent to some single photon detectors back in the fridge. And this is what real data looks like. Um, we turn on uh, the blue is sort of acquisition of various locks. Uh, but then in these periods, we're just uh, sending in laser light detuned by the appropriate amount. Filters, cavities are locked up. And we're just waiting for clicks to come out of these detectors. And indeed, you see click, click, click. We go back to holding things. And this is about one second of data. And those clicks, thanks to the nice technology in these detectors, are really clicks. You get a very large signal coming out of the top of the fridge whose uh, you know, existence is unambiguous and whose timing can be verified to within about a quarter of a nanosecond. So that kind of data, this pulse, really says a sideband photon was produced. And based on how we've arranged the system, that tells us that a phonon was added to this acoustic mode. It doesn't tell us what the acoustic mode was. Maybe it gives us a bit of information about it. But it says for sure, whatever it was, you just added exactly one phonon to it. So what we do is we take the frequency of this drive tone and we vary it back and forth. And as we vary the laser frequency, you know, the addition or subtraction of a phonon always produces a sideband photon that's shifted by the 300 megahertz of this acoustic mode, 315 megahertz. Um, but the ability of that photon to get to our detectors is really hinges primarily on the existence of these filters. So as we sweep this laser drive tone back and forth, we're, what we're really doing is we're sweeping the sideband tone over the filter cavity passband. And that's more or less this feature here. Strictly speaking, there's a background that we've characterized from various sources, but we understand it pretty well. And it's this peak that is uh, motionally generated uh, acoustic sideband photons arriving at our detector. This is what the data looks like when the laser is tuned off to the blue. When we take data with the uh, when we take data with the laser tuned off to this side, uh, the same data looks very similar. The rate of counts we get, the backgrounds are all kind of the same, uh, but the motional sideband is a little bit different in height. And this is a well-known quantum effect that falls, I think most people would say, in that first category of Gaussian quantum effects. This is sometimes known as the quantum sideband asymmetry. And there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, one way you can think about it is in terms of the difference between raising and lowering operators of the phonon mode, giving you different uh, rates for these processes. This is like even in physical chemistry, this is uh, uh, well understood. Uh, this is used for thermometry in a lot of settings and trapped ion experiments and the like. Um, so the next data that I'm going to show you, this is sort of raw data. And if you don't believe me that this is the quantum sideband asymmetry, that's 100% fair. Uh, so what I'm now going to show you is a much larger body of data where what I'm plotting for both the red drive and the blue drive is just the height of this feature, which is this feature minus the background, subtracted off. And if we do that as a function of just the refrigerator temperature and track the height of this red sideband and the height of this blue sideband, first of all, you can see that this difference is persistent and constant over this range of temperature. These two lines here are a fit where the only free parameter is just the vertical scaling of the data. If you like, it's telling us our detector efficiency and the like. But otherwise, it's just saying, hey, this acoustic mode should have a certain number of thermal phonons in it. And I should be getting a rate that's either proportional to that number, mean number of phonons, or proportional to that mean number plus one. And from this kind of fitting and analysis, we can say at the lowest temperatures, we're getting down to a temperature of about two phonons on average in this device. We can characterize the device in sort of more detail. Um, here, we just work at the lowest temperature. And instead of sitting, sending in as little laser power as we can manage, we uh, vary the amount of laser power that we send in. And as you start to increase the laser power, um, here we've normalized out uh, the count rate. We've normalized out the 
fact that we're sending in more laser power. Nevertheless, the count rates go up. That's just heating. You send in more laser power, the device is getting hotter. So you get more counts, but the separation between red and blue stays the same. It's just like heating up the mixing chamber. As you go to higher and higher power though, it begins to become important that the blue data is taken while driving the cavity on the blue side. And that anti-damps the acoustics, whereas the red data is taken on the red side, which tends to add some extra damping to the acoustics if you like to laser cool it. And that gives rise to this separation here. Anyway, this solid line is a fit to just the well-known dynamical back action, optical spring effects of optomechanics, a very simple model of heating in this device, and it fits the data very nicely. Um, so I should say at this point that like all of these features would be readily measurable using heterodyne detection or this a photodiode. Um, and they only evolve quantum effects like this that are very much in that first category. Um, so in some sense, we have gained nothing by using these nice single photon detectors in this funny scheme here, at least not the way the data has been analyzed here. Nevertheless, there is uh, interesting information to be had. It's had in the fact that we don't have access just to the mean rate of photons arrival, but we have all the information about their arrival time. And so if we begin to look at their correlations, you know, I just got two clicks from the red sideband. Now what are my chances of getting a click from the blue sideband conditioned on that? Then there's going to be much more interesting information about the kind of quantum mechanical states that are being prepared in this superfluid body. So the first thing that we're going to do, again, we take data that looks like this. We have the arrival times of all these photons, very long string of that information. And we're just going to look at the two-point correlation function. And we're going to do that by plotting a histogram of all the two photon uh, delays in our data. And this is what it looks like. Uh, we know that some of those counts come from uh, background photons. We know that those background photons are Poisson distributed, so we know how to correct for those. Uh, so here's that small correction. What we're going to do is now just normalize this curve to the degree of correlation at long times, which we should assume, which we assume to be non-correlated. Um, and that's what's shown here. Whoops. Nope. That's what's shown here. So that's what's known as the G2 function uh, of these photons. And uh, here's a fit to uh, the expression for a, a single mode thermal state which is one at long times, that's defined by the normalization. It's two at early times. This basically just says if you have a thermal state and you happen to have noticed that there's a lot of energy in it, well, that thermal fluctuation isn't going to go away until that mode has time to ring down. And indeed, this exponential decay time is just the damping rate of, of the mode. And the reason that this thermal statistics is showing up in our laser light is that what we're looking at is not the photons from the laser. We're looking at the photons that were produced by taking a laser photon and an acoustic mode phonon and generating a sideband photon. And so those photons inherit the thermal statistics of the acoustic phonons that are going into their production. Okay, so that's nice. It agrees well with theory. We can do lots of things like vary the laser power that we're sending in and the curves look almost the same, but decay a little faster or a little slower. That's just the fact that when you send in blue detuned light, you are by dynamical back action, making the oscillator decay more slowly. And so you get a slower decay here. Anyway, those are the corresponding fits. Uh, we can summarize that here. Uh, even if we vary the drive laser power and send in the laser light blue detuned and red detuned, we always see this uh, G factor of two at the origin, meaning uh, consistent at least with a the thermal state. And if we fit the exponential decay rates, uh, the more intense laser light we send in, uh, the bigger an effect there is of this optomechanical back action. And a simple linear fit gives out the coupling rate, which agrees very well with our independent measurements of this quantity. So all that's to say is this is uh, the two photon statistics um, look very much like the two phonon statistics one would expect for an acoustic mode in its thermal state. Uh, but given the body of data that we have in here, we don't have to stop at that. We want to look more closely at that. So now we look at the three photon correlations. So uh, for any three photons, we say, hey, what was the delay between the first two? And what was the delay between the second two? And we build up a histogram out of all such things. Uh, here's you know, the histogram of all, uh, you get a click now, when did you get your second click? And then how long after that did you get your third click? 
here's all the data, here's the correction from the known backgrounds. Again, we normalize by the long time behavior, and now we have what's known as the G3 of the photon arrivals. And the curve back here that's hard to see is the prediction from theory, actually the fits to the theory, this is the residuals. And it shows you, uh, again, exactly what you calculate, assuming that the acoustic mode is in a thermal state. And here it's sort of interesting that if you are in a thermal state and you suddenly get two photons, well, that tells you we had a really big thermal fluctuation. And that really big thermal fluctuation doesn't go away right away. And it tells you that, in fact, you're six times more likely to get a, a subsequent photon. Um, and again, we do this as a function of laser power. That enhancement at the origin is always about six. The decay rates, which is a little hard to see in these 3D plots, uh, depend on how hard we drive it and agree very well with what we've seen in other measurements. We can go further. We can look at the four-point correlation functions. Now each data point has three different delay times. So the data fills a three-dimensional cube, which is hard for me to show you. But here's just a plot of that uh, taken with one of the times being zero. And again, it's the same story. This is now the G4, and it goes up to an enhancement of 24 at the origin. Um, and so I, what I would say about this kind of data is it's, it's kind of neat, but it's also kind of boring. Because in these G2, G3, G4 functions, there is no sign of quantum mechanics whatsoever. If you have a thermal state, these higher order correlation functions don't care about h bar. They don't care that your mean phonon number is 0.1 or a million. Um, all the quantum effects, if you like, are in the G1s, the rate of these processes, which is what I showed you in the first slide. Um, so in some sense, that's sad. On the other hand, what we have done is we have characterized at an unusual depth that the bath to which our acoustic mode is coupled is really Gaussian. Like there's no strange non-Markovianity or non-Gaussianity in the bath as far as we can tell. Um, so that's good. We feel like we've done uh, a bit of homework here. Uh, but what we'd really like to do is move on and use some of these techniques to look at something other than a thermal state of the acoustic mode. And here the idea is to make use of this fact that I mentioned before, which is that really each one of these photon detection events doesn't leave the acoustic mode in a thermal state. It leaves it in some other state. And a phonon added thermal state can have really interesting quantum properties. So we've begun to start to uh, look at that partially just by taking this data and doing post-selection, saying, look, let's only look at data where we got two uh, sideband photons in rapid succession then how does the subsequent statistics look different? The other thing though, that's much more robust is to instead of just illuminating the device CW with a blue detuned laser beam and just count all the sideband photons that come out is to illuminate with blue uh, until you get a click and then illuminate with red and see what kind of click you get uh, conditioned on that outcome. So this is again, uh, experiments of this kind have been done by Simon Grublocker's group and Marcus Aspelmeyer's group. The basic idea is you apply a blue detuned pulse in the hope of writing a phonon, and then you apply a red detuned pulse in the hope of reading out that phonon in the form of a sideband. And we've just begun taking preliminary data there, and really this is just data showing that when we do short pulses with our lasers, our photon counts look sensible. You turn on the laser, uh, the device heats up a little bit on the time scale of microseconds, but not very much. And if you do this measurement as a function of fridge temperature, your red and blue sideband counts look like this. If you're paying careful attention to the last time I showed you data like this, you notice that we only got down to a device temperature of about two. But here, because our lasers are off most of the time, the device is getting cooled down to a mean phonon number of about one. Furthermore, if you do this kind of measurement at higher and higher laser power, uh, in the continuous measurement, the device got hotter. And I had to tell you this story about heating. Uh, but with these pulse measurements, we see no sign of heating. So basically, in the duration of these 10 or 20 microsecond pulses, energy is deposited, but the device just doesn't have time to equilibrate with that. The device just doesn't have time to get hot. And so we think this looks like a big win. We throw away a lot of measurement time with this low duty cycle. But during those measurements, we can operate at really high powers, really high count rates, and we can start at very low phonon numbers. So that's kind of where the experiments are. Um, I could pause and take questions here. Yeah, maybe a quick question. I know you've had a lot of work in the past on <clears throat> where the heat goes, but could you remind us in um, what the sense is for the, 
the majority of the heat uh, gets absorbed or yeah. you, you bottleneck there? So the, uh, the advertisement was, hey, liquid helium is just not going to absorb light. There's going to be no heating. And that statement is true and consistent with other measurements. But the, the mirrors are made of conventional optical materials. And they will all have an absorption of about one part per million. And so what we think is going on is that photons get absorbed somewhere in the glass. And then because the helium is in physical contact with the glass, that heat radiates out into the helium and eventually heats it up. So we would like to minimize that, but that's kind of what we live with for now. Right. I see. But it seems like uh, if you pulse it at the current rep rate, then uh, it equilibrates sufficiently or it cools down enough. For the time being yeah so i guess there are two time scales one is uh, you keep the pulse on short enough that it, the acoustic mode doesn't have time to realize that the fibers have gotten hot mm -hmm. and then you wait for long enough that the fibers cool back off again and that ends up giving us a duty cycle of about one percent i didn't put in all the numbers here but that means we can operate with the duty cycle of about one percent mm -hmm. nice um and uh, can you give us a sense of how long it, uh, oh, sorry, we have a question here from uh, the audience. Uh, what kind of laser augmentation do you think we may see in the future that might uh, enhance the experiment? We are not limited by laser performance, really. We're limited by um, this absorption in the coatings. So if we could get coatings that had not one part per million absorption, but tenth or a hundredth part per million, that would be a big help. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing super fancy about the lasers that we're using here. If, uh, if we could have a fiber beam path that was more efficient in how it gathered up photons and took them from our device to detectors, that would help. Um, but the lasers are great, and the single photon detectors themselves have very high quantum efficiencies, very low dark rates. It's really all the filters and beam path elements in between the device and the mm -hmm. detectors. And is there a way to improve the cooling rate? Um... Yes, <laughs> uh, we have a couple tricks up our sleeves. Um, one of which I will tell you about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, no, I'll tell you about both of them. Uh, so one of them is just to put in a little bit of helium three into the helium four. Helium three atoms act like a free gas and bounce around and are pretty good at adding some extra thermal conductivity to superfluid helium four. If you put in too much helium three, well, it's like a free gas and they will damp out the acoustic modes, but there does seem to be a pretty big window where a little bit of helium three would improve the thermal performance without harming the acoustic modes. So that's approach number one. Mm. Um, approach number two is to make the acoustic modes much higher Q, so high that they don't really care about the temperature of their bath. Like they're very weakly coupled to the bath. And in fact, the Qs of our acoustic modes are pretty modest, 10 to the five because the only way they're confined is by the acoustic impedance mismatch between helium and glass. So sound waves mostly, if they're in helium, don't wanna go into glass, but eventually they do, and that limits their quality factor. So we have two approaches to solving this, one of which we're already building now in our, device, in our lab. This consists of uh, mirrors that have two uh, coatings, one coating that's a high reflectivity mirror for the optics, and another one that's a coating that's high reflectivity for the sound waves. And there's some technical details in how you make this work, but basically it's just DVR stacks. Um, so based on this, we think that we can push up the quality factors of these modes by another couple orders of magnitude, which would help with their heating. The other thing that we're super excited about is that uh, there's something like we've been forgetting all along, which is that the speed of sound in helium is absurdly low compared to the speed of sound in any material like glass which means that total internal reflection is easy if you're a sound wave in helium. And in fact, the only way you can get a phonon from helium into a solid really is to come in at normal incidence. Otherwise, you're guaranteed reflection. And in fact, a fabry pro cavity is the one geometry in which the sound waves are all incidents at normal incidence uh, on, the, on the fiber mirror. So we did like the world's dumbest geometry here. So right now we're learning how to build ring cavities out of these fibers such that the acoustic modes will be confined by total internal reflection. And total internal reflection is really total. You know, it's limited only by kind of the smoothness of these surfaces. And based on what we know of the smoothness of these surfaces, we'd expect a quality factor for the acoustics of about three orders of magnitude greater than what we have now. 
Mm. So that would be huge for getting us cold. It would also mean that a phonon lifetime was not tens or hundreds of microseconds, but you know, a substantial fraction of a second. And that's a very long storage time for a quantum state. And, um, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> um, yeah, go on. I'll ask you the question. Okay. <laughs> so long storage time, what would you do with that? Well, it would be, uh, first of all, you could implement, uh, as Latko has demonstrated kind of amazingly, some really cool closed loop control. Um, if phonons live in here for a second or a fraction thereof, you know, you could gather a lot of information about that state by bouncing photons off of here and feed back to various drives or cavity detunings on a time scales that were much faster than the lifetime of this quantum state. That would really open up some interesting possibilities in quantum control, even just with a one mode device. Um, the other thing that we're very interested in is that this story about optical modes and acoustic modes just being defined simply by the length of this cavity is nice. And what it means is that if you take a whole bunch of these devices, and instead of what we do now, which is just glue them in place, put each end mirror on a simple piezo, independent piezo, and then you send in one laser beam, say 1550 nanometers, such that it's coupled to all of these devices. And then you just tune each piezo so that each cavity is resonant with this laser light. It doesn't have to be exactly the same cavity length, but they're just all integer multiples of half the laser wavelength then they will all be resonant with a laser light. And because they're resonant with 1550 nanometer light, because of this um, single mode mode matching, optomechanical mode matching story that I told you, every single one of these cavities uh, will couple that light to phonons with exactly the same frequency, 315 megahertz, which means that the sidebands coming out of here are indistinguishable. And that means you have a whole bunch of single photon sources that are truly indistinguishable and are so because of the kind of elegant geometry of the device and one tuning parameter. What that means is that if you start illuminating the device and you wait until you get a click, this doesn't kind of project your acoustic mode onto a one phonon clock state, but it projects the phonon in a way that's distributed over all these cavities into what's known as a W state. And that's a state with some interesting metrological and fundamental science kind of applications. And uh, if you did this with ring cavities or with this kind of cavity, it would be an interesting entangled state uh, with a one second lifetime. And because of all this is being done at telecom frequencies in single mode telecom fibers at 1550 nanometers, there's no reason for all these devices to sit in one common bath of liquid helium and one dilution refrigerator. These could be separated by kilometers of optical fiber networks. So this meets a lot of the conditions one would want for uh, the kind of networks of quantum memory that could uh, end up distributing entanglement in a useful way. So this is something we're really excited about. These two things are what we're kind of working on now. Yeah, this is really great. Oh, uh, I see you. I was going to ask on the left side, um, can you tell us a little bit more about how much of the modeling and how you do the modeling of the geometry and the Q factors? It seems like you have some good potentially predictive power um, from moving from, say, the geometry of the Fabry Perot, where you have a Q of 10 to the 5, you have some, uh, it seems like, relatively confident estimate of what would happen in a different geometry, such as the ring cavity or the DBRs. It's really just finite element analysis with some patience and the fact that we know what limits this Q factor here. Like at some point, you worry about, well, am I keeping track of the radiated acoustic energy, you know, very far out in my FEM model? And the reason that we kind of know what's going on here is that uh, this is some real insider baseball about praxial modes. Um, uh, but here's the thing. When light goes from vacuum into glass, its wavelength gets shorter. And that means that if it was a kind of praxial mode in vacuum, it's really praxial in the glass. And its phase fronts follow a very predict, you know, the same kind of pattern. And that's why you can take a curved piece of glass and can formally coat it with layer after layer. And each one of those layers will be matched to a phase front of your light. Sound, when it goes from liquid helium into glass, speeds up. Its wavelength gets longer and a lot longer. And what that means is that if you have up here a cavity mode that's 10 microns wide and its wavelength is say one micron, the instant that sound wave gets into the glass, um, well, the spot here is still 10 microns, but the wavelength is now 10 microns. 
And so this is not a paraxial spot. It's going to spread out spherically. And its phase fronts are not going to be matched uh, with your nice conformal DBR coatings. So uh, what we had to do was to design a cavity that was large enough, spot size of 100 microns, such that when the acoustic wavelength goes from 1 micron to 10 microns, it's still a lot smaller than the spot size. And so its propagation is still paraxial and nicely matched with these phase fronts. And we could see that whole story happening very systematically in our finite element analysis. If you do finite element here, you'll see that the phase fronts become just like hemispheres and don't line up with your layers. Here we can see that you know the phase fronts are much closer uh, to the paraxial ones, and we can just sort of systematically see the evolution of this Q getting bigger, and that's why we kind of understand it. The, the reason that we're confident over here is that since we build ring cavities with these uh, ring cavities and Fabry Pro, we we build optical cavities with these mirrors anyway. We know something about their roughness. Like we know we get hundred thousand finesse. That means your roughness can't be bigger than such and such. So if we assume that okay, that's the roughness on here, and that and then we say, well, okay, how much would that roughness limit the quality factor of a ring cavity mode? That's this number here, ten to the eight. Mm. I see. And these are um, something like console packages uh, or custom packages? Console over here. Here it's right. much more straightforward. Like uh, you sort of, their results, if your roughness is microscopic and sort of well behaved in various senses, um, if you say, uh, look, uh, I mean, actually, it's even simpler than that. If there's an optical mode that in such, some arrangement gives you a finesse of something, and then you ask, well, my acoustic mode, which has exactly the same spatial profile, how is it limited by the exact same roughness? Well, there's some very simple parallels you can draw there. So here it's not console or femme. It's, it's this straightforward reasoning about um, if my optical modes are getting scattered this way, how would my acoustic modes be getting scattered? I see. Thank you. I think. Um, one more slide you were about to show. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. That's the whole talk. You know, the last slide was the end of, uh, you know, this was the end of data we understand. This is what we're working on next. This is the new devices that we're building. Just very briefly, uh, what's going on in our lab is all the stuff that I told you about. We have a second experiment in which we're trying to get rid of these mirrors and these glass coatings and their absorption and build an optomechanical device entirely out of a drop of superfluid helium that is magnetically levitated in vacuum, and which is big enough to confine within it in whispering gallery modes, and that cavity would then be coupled to the drop's vibrational modes, um, hopefully solving a lot of technical problems and really opening up some interesting regimes of quantum optomechanics. We've learned how to levitate big drops in vacuum. We've measured their basic mechanical vibrational modes, and we're working on next steps here, uh, hoping to access some really interesting physics. The very last thing that we're doing is using some conventional optomechanical devices to explore topics in non-Hermitian dynamics. And the thing that would be fun to tell you about someday is that we have developed a, a sort of unified theoretical and experimental picture of how it is that higher order non-Hermitian degeneracies that are known as exceptional points, how those degeneracies get lifted in non-Hermitian systems. And the story is rather elegant, and just as an illustration of that, if you start with a triply degenerate non-Hermitian system, and you break its and you perturb that triple degeneracy in every which way, then the family of, of matrices that still have a double degeneracy, i.e., in which there's still some degeneracy left, um, constitute a trefoil knot, um, and this trefoil knot is related to how eigenvalues vary as you tune the system around various loops in here. Um, and so there's this suddenly elegant connection between knot theory and braid theory uh, of, of algebraic geometry and real things that we can measure and control in coupled oscillator systems. So these are kind of our three main projects. I should just say shamelessly, we would love to have postdocs join our group. We have a bunch of openings on these projects. Um, and with that, uh, thanks to all the folks who made these projects work. And thank you very much for your attention and for coming to this talk. All right. Thank you very much, Jack, for the wonderful talk. Um, we had many questions during the seminar, so I invite uh, the audience to share any final questions you may st still have in the chat box. Uh, and then uh, 
unless I see any more, I, th I think uh, since we're almost 15 minutes over. Um, oh, by the way, I should mention that there were a lot of good comments from the audience saying, you know, this is highly lucid presentation and very cool. Uh, Thank great you. Work. So, uh, Thanks. So relay those to you. Uh, and I think unless I see any final questions, I would like to thank you, the audience, for tuning in today. I'd like to thank you, Jack, uh, for accepting our invitation and for the great talk Thanks. Uh, and the great presentation. And I'd like to um, remind everyone that you can go back and rewatch this talk or catch parts of it. It will stay live here on the YouTube channel. Uh, next week, Friday at noon Eastern time, same time, we will continue with the seminar series. So please do tune in. And so with that, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you, Jack. Uh, and thank you. we'll see you next Friday. Yeah, see you next Friday. All right.